Anyway, uh, today we want to let's see record. Okay. Uh, today we want to talk about uh, economics, right? Uh, economics. So there are two approaches to teaching you guys economics. The first approach is I can give you my notes. The second approach is I can just follow through your study module. I think I will follow through your study module, but I have notes on economics. If you need them, I'll just send them to, uh, to you guys, which I usually use for, for a lecture. But I just want to make sure that the content that I'm giving you is specifically uh, to your study module and not too, not too general. Anyway, uh, economics now. When we're studying economics, uh, it's, it's a very interesting subject. Uh, the interesting part of economics is it covers everything. Economics covers uh, production, manufacturing, covers uh, finance, uh, covers marketing. It covers a lot of different things because economics is the study of human behavior. It is why we call them humanity, it's the study of human behavior. So what are we studying? Uh, in economics, when we are saying we are studying human behavior, we are studying the choices that people make. And why do people make choices? The people make choices because they have got certain alternatives that are available to them, and they have certain limitations where they cannot choose everything that is there. They have to make specific choices on what can I do with the limited amount of things that I have. So the definition of economics by its nature is the study of human behavior in terms of how they make choices given the scarcity of the resources available in an economy and the unlimited nature of human wants. Now, what do we mean by that? What we are basically saying is that I, is, is, is James, I, I, I really like, you know, an odd, I, I like an odd, but I also like Lexus and I like BMW and I like Mercedes. So if I had the option, right, I would buy all of them. I would have a garage with you know, 20 cars in them and I would drive one each and every day. I, I like that. But there is a limitation in terms of the resources that are available to me to purchase said cars. And because of that limitation, I'm going to make a choice. Now, economics is the study of how, why I make the specific choices. Why did I choose the BMW over the what? over the, the, the bands. Now, from a layman's perspective, you might say, but is that really what economics is all about? Actually, it is. The only difference is when they're talking in economics, they just remove the, the, the bands and the BMW, and then they start talking about what goods and services should we produce? What markets should a business enter? What level of production should be available in a, what, in a company? But it's all about the study of choices. And for you to start the choices, you need to understand why do we make choices in the first place? So in your introduction to economics, why do we make choices in the first place? So for you to understand why we make choices, you need to understand what we call the resources that are available in the economy. So sometimes we call them the resources, sometimes we call them the factors of production. Now there are four factors of production or four resources that you need to know about when you're studying economics. And these four resources or four factors of production are your lands, are your labor, are your capital, and your entrepreneurial schemes. So how you make choices in relation to those four factors of production is what economics is all going to be about. Now, for us to study economics, we now need to understand there are two basic major concepts in economics. There's what you call microeconomics and there's what you call macroeconomics. Now, microeconomics, we are looking at the individual. We are looking at the person and saying, what decisions are they going to make as gems? What decisions are they going to make as Mkosi? What decisions are they going to make as Kai? So we are looking at the individual decision-making processes of people or what we call in economics, economic agents. Now, economic agents can be people. Economic agents can be companies, right? Because they are still individuals. A company is a separate legal persona. They are still individuals. So you are basically looking at the households and the what and the firms and their decision making are processes that they are making. So a lot of microeconomics is also what we call positive economics, which is theory based. 
you are looking at the theory, you are looking at the scientific facts that have been studied over time and proven to be right. For example, we know that if you increase the price, it is likely the quantity demanded by the people is likely going to go down. Why does it go down? That's an economic fact. We'll talk about it uh, uh, in, in a topic called consumer behavior, right? It's an economic fact. That is what that is there. But that's what you're studying under microeconomics. But macroeconomics now is a bit different. Macroeconomics is you're looking at the broader landscape. This is what you hear on, SA, on SB, uh, SABC News, on E News, on the go different government platforms, with all those economic things that you are hearing about. That's macroeconomics because you're looking at the broader perspective. You're no longer looking at the household or at the business, but you're looking at the economy as a whole. You're looking at the population of South Africa. You're looking at the government and the decisions that the government is making with respect to issues like unemployment, inflation, and et cetera, that they are making within the what in the economy and how it will affect the GDP and the growth and the economic development of what of South Africa. So that's macroeconomics. You're looking at the broader perspective. But as you're looking at the broader perspective, you are most likely going to dwell into an area called normative economics. Normative economics, you're looking at the rationale. Advice. You're saying we ought to have a low inflation rate. There's no fact about it, but it's just what you are advising, it's what you're expecting, it's what you think, it's what you recommend. So you will notice that there will be a lot of recommendation in macroeconomics, whereas there's a lot of theory in microeconomics. So those are the broad categories of what of macro of, of, of economics that you're going to what you're going to study. But within both these broad categories, you will find those four factors of production is your underlying rationale. That is your land, your labor, your entrepreneurial skills, and your what and your um, uh, and your and your capital. Now, let me just go a little bit deeper and try to describe these factors of production before we go any further. Because most of what we're going to be talking about, they will relate to these factors of production. So we need to clearly understand what they are, okay? I'm thinking of checking my notes, but it's fine. Uh, when you are looking at the four factors of production, right? The first factor, we call it a primary factor of production, that is land. The second factor, again, a primary factor of production, that is your, um, your labor, right? So if you are looking at land as a primary factor of production, what does land constitute? We are saying that for you to be able to produce various goods and services in South Africa, right? You are going to need the actual physical land. You are going to need the water. You are going to need the sea. You're going to need the wind, you're going to need the sun, you're going to need the trees and the various natural resources. So all those various natural resources, excluding people, excluding labor, are part of land. So that's land as a factor of production. Now, remember what I said in the beginning, economics is the study of what of scarcity. So when I say scarcity, I'm saying that there is only a limited amount of land that is available in South Africa. There are square meters. You can actually calculate how many square meters are available in South Africa. That's scarcity. We don't have infinite land. There is a limited amount of trees. There is a limited amount of water that is available for us to consume or for us to use in our manufacturing processes as what is business. So that's land. The second primary factor of production is labor. Labor, we are now talking about the people. So labor can come in two ways. Labor can be the intellectual capacity of the people, or labor can be the physical capacity of the work of the people. So if you are looking at your farm workers that are tending to the gardens in the farm, they are part of labor. If you are looking at your engineers, your accountants, and etc., your lawyers that are using their heads in the various companies, you are still looking at what? You're still looking at the labor that you need. So again, it's a factor of production. Why? And it's limited. Why? Because we're saying that we have 53 million people in South Africa. We don't have more than that. So we cannot have a labor capacity of more than 53 million, more than the population. Right? So that's why we're saying it's limited. It's scarce. The labor is what is scarce. A typical example of scarcity in terms of labor is how many actual scientists do we have? How many uh, physicists do we have in South Africa? 
there is a number to it. Maybe we can say we have got 110 physicists in South Africa. But do we need more physicists? Yes, we need more physicists because they have a certain contribution that they're going to make. But because they ask us, we have to make choices in terms of how we are going to allocate them across the various departments in government or in companies and etc. Then that's number two. Then number three, we have what? We have what we call capital. Now capital is not a primary factor of production. It's now what we call a secondary factor of production, right? So when you're looking at your, uh, at your capital, okay, so let me just do this. Um, maybe this is a bit distracting. Uh, micro economics. Okay, just give me a second. Economics. Economics one A. I just want you to also be seeing what, what I'm talking about uh, so that it's clear in case any of the words that I speak are not clear. You can also just see on the slide that I usually use. Okay. Let's share the slides. Okay, that's better. Just wanted to make sure that you can also see what I'm talking about. Okay, so I was now on what? On, on capital, right? So we talked about land, we talked about labor. Now, capital is what we call a secondary factor of production. Now, why is it secondary? We are saying that capital is actually manufactured from other factors of what? <laughs> other factors of production. Now, capital in itself, right? There is what we call financial capital and there's what we call economic capital. In economics, financial capital, we don't really talk much about. We're not interested in it because financial capital is money, that's cash. But economics, we call it economic capital. Economic capital, we are saying that the capital goods that you use for your production processes, that is your plant and your machinery, then if you are a farmer, your tractors and combined harvesters, right? The machinery that you use in your company. For, for me, for example, in my own business, the laptops that I'm using, the microphones and et cetera, that's part of what of economic what capital because I'm using these manufactured goods for me to be able to produce a service or to be able to produce a specific good. So that's what, that's economic capital, right? And then again, economic capital is case. Why is it scarce? Because you need to manufacture it using scarce resources. So it's also very scarce in nature. You don't have a, an unlimited amount of economic capital. It's also very limited. Then lastly, you've got entrepreneurial uh, or entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial skills. This is again a secondary form of uh, uh, resource or factor of production. Why? Because it's built on labor. It's from the labor, but this is a different form of labor. This is no longer the physical labor or the intellectual labor, but these are individuals that are willing to take the risk of combining all the other factors of production for the purposes of creating goods and services. And in that process, they are going to make a profit. So that's entrepreneurship as a factor of production. Again, there is a limited number of entrepreneurs that exist in South Africa. You know, that is why the government is always saying we need more entrepreneurs. There are always these SMEs funding and et cetera, where they're trying to encourage entrepreneurship. Why? Because there is a limited amount of entrepreneurs that are, that are there. Now that we have highlighted the limited nature or, of these resources, now I can clearly explain now what are the key concepts of economics. So the first key concept of economics is scarcity, right? Scarcity simply meaning that there's what? There is limited resources that are available for any specific process. 
We as a nation want to provide goods and services, but there are limited resources. Then the second key concept is unlimited wants, right? Unlimited wants. We are saying that the people in the country want a lot of different things. So when you match scarcity and unlimited wants, you have what we call the economic problem. We we'll actually describe, talk more about it in a couple of slides. But if you match scarcity and unlimited wants, that is where you find what you call the economic problem. And basically the definition of what economics is what is all about. Now, because you've got scarcity and unlimited wants, the individual that has got unlimited wants, right, has to make a choice in terms of what to produce. So like I said, I want to have a lot of nice fast cars. I also want to have a lot of nice good houses, maybe in Durban, maybe in Cape Town, right? So the now begs the question now, what then should we produce with the limited resources that we have? Should we produce cars or should we produce houses? Should we produce food or should we produce clothes, right? So we have to make a choice in terms of the what, in terms of what should we produce as a nation because of the unlimited nature of the ones that what, that exist, right? So when we make that choice, right? So for example, if I decide that I am going to what? To, 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 to produce a car instead of a house, right? So the moment I put the resources into production of a car, which means I no longer have resources to produce the house, Right. So the house was my next best alternative. I would have loved to have a house, but I can no longer have it because I put my resources in the what? In the car. So the house becomes a cost, what we call in economics, an opportunity cost. We're saying that there was an opportunity for me to get a house, but that opportunity no longer exists. Why? Because I've chosen a car. So opportunity cost then becomes the value of the next, best alternative for gold, which is the house. But we don't just say the opportunity cost is the house, but we say the value of the house is the what is the opportunity cost for what for, 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 for me for the choice that I have what that I have made as a what as an as an, as an, as an individual. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, all right, let's do this. Let's go back to our study module. Now there's a concept that I highlighted uh, where I said uh, we have what we call uh, the economic problem, right? The, where I said that if you mix two things, scarcity on one end and unlimited ones on the other end, you have what? You've got the economic problem. Now the economic problem basically is how do we distribute? How do we take care or how do we manage limited resources and unlimited ones. That's what the economic problem is all about. Now you can split the economic problem into three specific areas. The three specific areas or the three specific questions of economics is what to produce, how to produce, and to whom to distribute. Now, what do we mean by that? We are saying that us as economic agents, us as households, us as businesses, us as governments, when we're attending to economic issues, we are going to be asking ourselves, what should we produce? Now, why do we ask what should we produce? Remember, we have only a limited amount of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial skills, but we've got a 53 million people with, with a lot of different needs. So we need to know what should we produce? How many thousands of cars should we produce in a year? How many tons of clothes should we produce in a year? How many liters of milk should we produce in a year? That is the question. What should we produce as a, what, as a country? That's question number one. Question number two is how do we produce it? Now we've determined that no, we want 53 tons of wheat. We want uh, 53 million uh, uh, liters of milk. We want 10,000 cars and 5,000 radios. That is what we want to produce. But again, as economic agents, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to produce it? Now, let me explain on that part. Now, as a farmer, for example, you, or let's say as a person who owns land, you have a choice, right? As a farmer, you have a choice, right? You want to produce uh, wheat, 
10,000 tons of food. Now, option number one, you can go and get uh, five tractors, right? You can get five combined harvesters and get five different drivers and then get your seed and et cetera. And then you what? You start your production process. You end up at 5,000 tons, right? That's one way of producing. It. But if you go to the next farmer, you will notice that the next farmer maybe only has one sector. But instead of five people working on the farm, he has got 100 people working on the farm, which means that he's losing a lot of what? Of manual labor. So you can see that farmer number one opted for capital intensive production. Farmer number two opted for labor intensive production. Now, they have, there are various reasons for doing so, but that is the question of economics. How do we produce? What is the most efficient way of producing? Because remember, you want to make a profit. So you are trying to find a method of production that is going to give you the maximum amount of profit possible. You want to find that factor of uh, that method of what of combining the four factors of production to produce the best profit possible. So that's question number two: how to produce. Then question number three is for whom? How to distribute? For whom to distribute? Now you have decided on how much clothes you want to produce, how, many milk, how much milk you want to produce. You have decided on the way you're going to produce them. Now, at the end of the year, you have harvested your wheat. Is there sitting in your barn? How are you going to distribute it? Are people just going to come and take your wheat? Are they going to stand in a line and they're going to give 50 kg to each and every one? Or they're going to just put a price and then whoever can afford it will come and pay for it. How are you going to distribute it? So, those are the three major economic questions. And economics is about answering those economic questions. So you will notice at a certain point in time, I will introduce what we call uh, the economic systems, what we call the command system, the free market system, the mixed uh, system. All these systems are trying to answer the three economic questions. They're trying to answer what to produce, how to produce, and for whom. Right? Are we producing what we are what? What we are producing as a what? Is 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 a country? Right? So let's see. Um, all right. And let's talk about the economic systems. I, I want to talk about. It. I think let's talk about them because I think it will make sense if we just cover them right now. So there are three major types of economic systems which answer the three questions that we've what that we've uh, talked about over here. So remember the questions, what to produce, how to produce, and uh, for whom to distribute. Now, there's what we call a market system, a command system, and what we call a mixed system. A command system, an example, is, it's very rare, but an example, if you look at a country like Cuba, look at a country like North Korea, or in the past, you could look at China and Russia. They were, they were at a certain point in time, command system. A command system, it's a system whereby there is a central planning authority like a government, which sits down at the beginning of the year and then decides that for this year, we are going to produce 10,000 cars, we are going to produce 5,000 televisions, and etc. Et which means that the central authority is the one that is making the decisions of what to produce. They are also going to make the decision of how to produce, which means that they are going to say, of the population that we have, we want 50,000 doctors the doctors are going to be allocated to these respective hospitals, right? Of the population that we have, we want 5,000 to be factory workers, and et cetera, and et cetera. Then they are also going to determine how to distribute. Maybe they're going to do rationing and say that uh, each and every year we are going to give cars to people that are 25 years old, which means if you're 25 years or older, you're going to get a car. If you're younger, you're not getting a what? You're not getting a car. So they're also going to decide for whom to distribute. So I'm sure you can already see challenges with that kind of a system. That is why it's a very rare system because it has failed over time. They've tried it and it has failed over time. They've seen that it does not work to use a, what, a command system. So that's on one end. Then on the other hand, you have what we call a free market economy or a free system, right? A market system. A market system is a system where there is no central authority. No one centrally decides what to produce how to distribute and for whom to distribute. It is decided by individual economic units. It is decided by you and me. 
Me who owns the business, it is me who decides how much I want to produce. You who own the money, it is you who decides what you want to pay for, what you want distributed to you. So that's a free market system. It is called, it is controlled by the invisible hand, the market system by price signals. That is what controls the, what, the market system. Again, the market system, pure as it is, it is also a failure. It will usually fail. Though it is a better failure, boys, you will notice that most economies are aligned to the what to the market system. But you will notice that in most economies, there is a little bit of intervention. You can see that there is a government that is trying to do funny things in there. Why are they trying to do that? Because in a market system, capitalism happens. And when there's capitalism, there's likely to be abuse of the what of the populace. And that results in what we call market failure. At a certain point in time, we'll go deeper into what is market failure. Right. Uh, but just generally know that market system can lead to what to market failure, which leads us to the mixed economy, which is the majority economy in the whole of planet Earth, where you see most countries are mixed. They generally are a market system, but they have a government which is a certain level of authority. Whether they implement wage controls, price controls, whatever it is that they do, there is a certain limitation that the government puts in place to manage the welfare of the people or to manage the failures of the market in which it was in which it exists. So I think this basically uh, covers the, the, the introduction to, 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 to economics, the first part of economics, the basic introduction to what? Uh, to, to economics. Now I want to go into the second part of economics where, where we are now going to go into the theories of what of economics. So we're going to talk about the production possibility curve and then we're going to demand and supply and whatnot and whatnot. But are there any questions for what we've talked about so far before we, we move on to the next stage? Are there any questions for what we've talked about so far? No question. Okay, thank you. So if there are no questions, the next thing that we want to talk about, this is two in unit number one, but it's a slightly different country. We are now talking about what we call the production possibility curve. Now, this is a theory that seeks to explain all the various concepts that we're talking about the scarcity, the opportunity cost, and etc. All these theories can be explained through the production possibility frontier, or sometimes it is known as the production possibility curve, right? That's another name that you can give it, or the production possibility theory. That's another name that you can what? That you can give it, but it all explains all the different aspects that we what? That we're talking about. Now, for us to understand the production possibility frontier, we are saying that consider a closed economy. Now, what do I mean by a closed economy? I mean that an economy, that does not do international trade. It's South Africa alone. There's no Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, USA, and etc. It's just South Africa alone. Closed borders. There is no international trade. Now consider that South Africa, which is a closed economy, only produces two things, right? They produce pizza, right, for food, and they produce CDs for entertainment. So that's what people want in South Africa. Only those two things. They want food and they want entertainment. So those are the two things that South Africa do. This is economics, right? So economics, there is a lot of assumptions, crazy assumptions. What economy can bring these two things? Right? It's economic. It's just a way of trying to understand the basic rationale of economics. So consider that you want food and entertainment, pizza and what, and CDs. Those are the two things that are being produced by the what? by the economy. So remember, you have what? Four resources that you have, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial skills. Now, given your four resources, if you use all of your resources, if you use all the land in South Africa, all the labor in South Africa, all the entrepreneurs in South Africa, and all the capital in, the, in South Africa, and say we're going to just do CDs alone, you are going to produce 15 million CDs. If you use everything and say we're just putting it into CDs, picture in CDs, that's what we're going to do. We are going to produce what 15 million CD, which is point number A over here. Which is point A, 15 million CD. Now on the other end, 
You can also decide, you know what, what are we going to do with CDs? We want food. So we are going to do pizza, pizza, only pizza. That's what we are going to want to do. So if you produce only pizza alone, you end up with 5 billion pizzas. There are no CDs, just pizza alone. You end up with what? 5 billion pizzas here, which is your point what? Your point number F. So those are your starting points. But remember, you are rational people. Right. You are rational people. You're not going to produce pizzas alone. You're not going to produce CDs alone. You need to eat and entertain yourself. So you are going to likely produce a combination of either one of the two. Now, for example, you can produce a combination B over here. So you can see it B over here. This is what? 14... million CDs and one million what pizzas. So that's a combination that you can what that you can produce. So remember what you say, choice. So you have a choice of what? Of either A or of B. So you have a choice. You can choose either A or you can choose either B. Now the reason for this choice between the what between the two is because you are a rational individual. You are not just going to take one option. You're going to look for different options that satisfy your, what? your various needs. And then let's go on. You can choose this over here, C, right? So at C, we can see over here, it's now 12. And over here, it's now 2 million, right? Another different option. So you can see that the option, there are other various options that you can have, right? As a what? As, 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 as a household in making your decision or as a firm or whatever, all right? But the most interesting thing is remember what I said. I'm saying you are using all your factors of production. For you to produce at point A, we said you have used everything. For you to produce at point B, Yes, you're producing both, but you have used everything. Which means if we connect all these lines together, they form this particular cave. Huh? If we connect all these lines together, these different points, they form this particular cave. This cave is what we call the production possibility frontier or the production possibility cave. And we say that it is the point that joins in, right? The various choices that you have provided you have used all your factors of production, which means that anything that is outside, that is above. So let's say, for example, if I come here and say this is point number what? Point number H over here. Let's say this is H over here, right? This is not attainable because we're saying that over here we've used all of our factors of production, which means anything outside this PPC is not attainable. Why is it not attainable? Because of what? Scarcity. So if you're looking at the PPC, anything beyond the PPC, anything beyond the PPC represents scarcity. It represents points that you cannot obtain. Why? Because you've got limited amount of resources. Now, the vice versa also holds true, which means a point like Z over here represents inefficiency. Why? Because we're saying that if you are producing at Z over here, you have not used all your sectors of production. Don't worry, I will show you how. But you have not used all your what? Of your sectors of production if you're producing at point Z. At point Z. Now, let's explain the concept now of opportunity cost. It will also help us explain our point number set. Right. Opportunity cost, we say that it is what? It is the value of the alternative that has been what? That has been forgotten. By the, by the individual. So if you were producing at A, right? If you're producing at A, you are getting 15 million, right? Uh, CDs. But if you produce at B, you're now getting what? 14 million CDs, right? That's what you're not, that's not what you're getting, right? But you are now gaining what? 1 million pizzas. So it means that for the you to gain 1 million pizzas, right? you had to lose how many? 15 minus what? Minus 14, right? Which gives you uh, 1 million, right? 15 minus 14 gives you uh, 1 million, which means that for you to be able to produce 1 million pizzas, the opportunity cost for you 
was 1 million what CDs. But here's the interesting thing. Let's move to point number C. How much did you gain in pizzas when we moved from B to C? We only gained 1 million, which is 2 minus 1, right? We only gained 1 million. But what is the opportunity cost? If we calculate again, you can see at point C, we are now at 12 million, but at point B, we were at what? At 14 million, which means that we lost two. So that's an interesting thing. You can see that initially the opportunity cost was 1 million pizzas. Now it's what? It's 2 million pizzas. Let's go to point number D. If you go to point number D, you can see we are, we are now at 3 million. We've gained what? Another 1 million. But how much have we lost from C to what? To D. If we check over here, D is probably 8. So 12 minus 8, that's 4. So now it's 4. So you can see that opportunity cost is actually increasing as you go down the production possibility curve. That's the reason for this shape that you have here. It's a decreasing, so increasing opportunity cost. Opportunity cost increase as you go down the what? The production possibility curve, right? These are a lot of theories around the internet, et cetera, but it's important to just know that it's what? It's increasing as you go down the production possibility cost. Now, given that concept, that, that's the concept of opportunity cost. Given that concept, now let's look again at point Z over here. What is the opportunity cost at point Z? So I think at point Z, you are gaining 3 million versus what? Versus 5 million. That's what you are gaining. If you move from point Z to point number E, right? You have gained what? 1 million what? 1 million pizzas. How many CDs have you lost? Check again, zero. You've not lost any CDs. So there's no opportunity cost. So if there's no opportunity cost, then that, why well, there's no efficiency in that, in, in that country, why? Because efficient is whenever you have to make a choice, you have to sacrifice something that is efficient. But if you can make a choice and add to what you were doing without sacrificing anything, then you were not efficient in the first place, which means that there were some resources that were like idle. There was unemployment that was happening in the what in the country that you what that you were operating in. So that's the what that's the uh, theory of what of the uh, production possibility curve or the theory of the uh, PPC. Okay, I think that's most of the stuff that we're explaining. Let's talk about this, the PPC and economic growth. Now, remember from our first graph, we say that this is the PPC, right? And we say that any point beyond the PPC over here is not attainable, right? We say it's not, it's not attainable, right? But is the PPC static? Can it not move, whether it's moving outwards to that unattainable point or it's moving inwards? to that inefficient point? The answer is yes, the PPC can actually move. And when the PPC move, we call it economic growth or economic recession or depression, depending on the what, on the movement of the PPC. So if it moves outwards, we call it economic growth. If it moves inwards, we call it a what, a recession. Now, what can result in the movement of the PPC? Right. Now remember, we say the PPC is governed by the resources because we are saying that the PPC represents what you can produce if you utilize everything that you have. So what happens if everything that you have increases? It means that the PPC can also increase, which means that if you had 53 million people in South Africa this year, right? That is your labor force. But in 10 years time, you know, it's 80 million South Africans, which means that you have got an extra 17 million South Africans who can actually add to the output of what of South Africa. So you can see that population growth can result in a movement in the what in the PPC. That's option number one. Option number two, let's look at capital, right? For example, in the past, we did not have combined harvesters. People would physically go into the uh, into the mill or into the maize field and you know pluck it up pick up the cotton in the sector. So you would need maybe 100,000, 100 workers to go through the field the whole day for them to pick up the cotton. But nowadays with one combined harvester, you can do the work of 100 people. Now that has resulted in what? In more output. Why? Because you are using uh, uh, the, the, what, the improvement in the, what, in the technology. So when technology improves, it also means the capital 
that you have will actually increase its efficiency or its effectiveness. And therefore, you can see that your PPC can what can improve. Let's look at entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship or uh, even labor, let's look at those two, entrepreneurship and labor. Entrepreneurship and labor is also about the mental capacity of the people. So for example, if you train the people, you educate them, you make sure you invest in education, in tertiary education and etc. And the people become wiser, they become more intelligent, they contribute more to society. Therefore, it also means the PPC will shift what? Will shift outwards. Why? Because the labor does not necessarily increase physically, but can also increase entrepreneurial and et cetera. That's another way of increasing. But we say that it can also shrink. So what can result in a shrink of the what? Of the PPC? An example is emigration. Emigration was saying there are 53 million in South Africa. And then 5 million decide they no longer want to work in South Africa. They want to go to the USA. You have lost labor. Therefore, PPC will shrink downwards. Or war. If you have a war, people get killed. Or you lose land. In a war, you can lose land. The other country can, you know, we won the war. We are taking Gauteng. Gauteng is now ours. So again, you have what? You have lost your land. It's interesting. Huh? Again, you have lost your, your land. So those is are various ways in which your PPC can shift to the left or to the right. But in addition to shifting to the left or to the right, there is what we call a swivel or a skewed PPC. So you can see over here, on one end, it has not shifted. But on this end, there is a what? A shift. This usually happens when there is an improvement in technology specific to one specific product. For example, in this one, there is wine and then there is beer. So if the technology that improves is only for beer, you will notice that only beer will increase, but wine will not, what? Will not increase. So that's when you see this skewed uh, uh, PPC or a swivel in the one in the PPC of that specific uh of that specific uh nation. Okay. Ah, wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, let me just uh check. I think we're actually done. Let me just check the my lecture notes and see if there's anything left in chapter one before we close for today. Yeah, I think we are done for, for, for chapter one for today. Uh, questions that you might have? Yeah, uh, what's happened? Um, okay, it's a good mm -hmm. evening. Eh? Yes. What happened in the PPC during the unrest? Can you give an update? Not what the assumption. Children, after an and after an unrest, what happened to the PPC? Okay, in South Africa. Oh, to the PPC in South Africa after the unrest. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Let, all right. Let me draw. Just give me a second. Let me draw something so that uh, I will get what good. Okay. So, consider this now. Uh, Right. Consider that this was the what? This was the PPC for what? For South Africa, right? This was the PPC. What is calling me? Consider that this was the PPC of what? Of South Africa, right? So again, it's an assumption, right? Assuming that South Africa produces two kinds of goods, we say they are producing consumer goods, which are the goods that you consume, and then the producer goods, the uh, capital goods, uh, which are the goods that are used in manufacturing and etc. Right. So if we were to assume, which is wrong, but if we were to assume that we were producing, right, on the PPC over here, this is where we were producing, right, is a what is a country, right? When the unrest happened, right, there are two aspects of the unrest, right. One aspect aspect affects the PPC then the other aspect does not affect the PPC. Now, the looting in itself that happened will not affect the PPC, right? Because we're saying the PPC is about production, right? It's not about uh, what has already been produced. We have produced it, so we have utilized our resources, so that will not affect our PPC. But 
the looting that happened can result in what? In the decision-making processes, whereby, for example, someone who was employing, right, 50 workers before, then decides now that my, uh, my, my, my small business is what is, uh, has been looted, I no longer have the capital, why should I what? Why should I continue producing? So number one, you are going to see that in the months following the, 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 the looting that, that has happened, right? You are going to see that there is likely going to be a reduction in the production. Why? Because the labor is not going to be fully utilized. So when you're not fully utilizing your labor, labor is a factor of production, which means instead of producing on the PPC, you're producing within the what? Within the PPC. Then number two, entrepreneurship. Now, if a person becomes discouraged during the process of the looting to start their own business, which means that you're going to have an entrepreneur that is no longer using the entrepreneurial skills, again, that's a resource that you're no longer using as a what? As, 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 as a country, which means again, instead of producing on the PPC, you are now what? You are now within the PPC, right? That uh, you are now within the what? Within the, within the PPC. So those are some of the effects that you can see of activities like that happen during the looting in terms of the PPC. The basically thing that is going to affect resources such as the entrepreneurship in such as labor and lead to the underutilization of those resources, which means that after the looting has happened, we are no longer producing at our full capacity as a nation. Why? Because there is now some people that have been laid off because the businesses have closed down, or there are now some entrepreneurs that are no longer willing to take the risk. Because entrepreneurship is about taking risk. Now they've seen that there is too much risk in South Africa, so they are no longer willing to take the risk to combine the factors of production. Therefore, they are now idle in the previous and do we see that you now have what? You now have underutilization of your PPC or underemployment of the resources in your what in your PPC. I hope that uh, that, that, that that clarifies from your question. Yeah, I can proceed. Okay. No, 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 I, I'm done with this one. Any other question? Yes, my hand is up. Yes, Temba. Yes, Temba. Yeah. Um, firstly, let me understand the PPC. Is it the same as the PPF? Yes, yes, it's the same. It's the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Then the, 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 my question is on the mm -hmm. huge economic growth. Uh, mm -hmm. Like the example that has been shown here, mm -hmm. there is a wine and a beer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which one is... Um, which one do you see as a shrink between the two? I'm failing to interpret this. All right, it's okay. Let, 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 let's put it this way. So this is your what? This is your PPC, right? And then let's say that there are two uh, factors, there are, there are two goods that you're producing, right? On one end, we said that there were CDs, right? And then on the other end, we said there was what? There was pizza, right? Yeah. Right. Those are the two that you are what that you are producing. So, for example, there is technology that is used in pizza production, the oven that you use in pizza production. In the past, you used your charcoal and you created your oven from, uh, from some mud and etc. And you had your pizza, right? But then someone, a genius, comes up with an idea. Why do we create an oven out of aluminium? And then within the aluminium, we put in some zinc and etc. That makes sure it's much water in the what in the oven. Which means that in the past, for you to produce one pizza, you needed twenty minutes of the pizza in the what in the oven, right? Correct. But with the new capital, with the new technology, because technology represents capital, you instead of twenty minutes, you can now produce a pizza in ten minutes, right? So if in the past you were producing five million pizzas. Right, given the resources that you had. Now, because you, it takes less time to produce a pizza, which means that it is likely you're going to, it might not double because of other issues, but let's assume that it doubles to what? To 10, because you, instead of 20 minutes, you now only need 10 minutes to produce a pizza, which means that although the technology for CDs will remain the same, because nothing changed on CD part, but for pizza, you can see that the PPC will move to what? 10 million pizzas over there. Why? Because there has been a change in the technology specifically for the manufacturing of pizza. 
That's basically what we're saying. We're saying that it has shifted to the what to the uh, to the right to the PPC only on the side of the pizza, right? But if it was not that, it would have shifted both of them, right? But it has only shifted on the side of the pizza because the technology that has changed only affects the the pizza. Are you answered, Simba? Um, thank you very much. I'm answered. All right. Any other questions? The other question that I had is on the first uh, presentation you made, mm -hmm. uh, where we were talking of the production, uh, those three questions in the production process. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just checking through here, but uh, there were three questions, the why mm -hmm. or what? The, the, the what, how? the how, and for whom. Yes. But did you left those two, the when and where, uh, purposely? Uh, when and where? And you know what, what? Sometimes what happens with lecturers is they can also get excited. <laughs> economic, there are three economic questions. I'm sure maybe your lecturer just put in some way anyway, but there are three major economic uh, questions. Uh, we, let's see when and where. Yes, there we are. Okay. When and where. Sometimes production selections often a recession. Uh, what production? What makes production drives in government exchange? And then uh, the way, what is telecommunication that economic papers answer the questions about where things are produced? Okay, that's interesting. All right, it's fine. I will try to explain from this point of view, but normally there are three economic questions. What to produce? Okay. If, you, if you check most test books, they will tell you there are three. What to produce, how to produce, and for whom to what to produce. These are additional right. uh, questions that we've put in through. So when he's talking about when, right, he's highlighting um, in terms of uh, we have what we call a business cycle, a business cycle. A business cycle, basically in economics, we are looking at uh, our GDP. It's more of a macroeconomics concept, not micro. We are talking of our GDP, right? GDP means uh, gross domestic product, which means the output of a nation, what has been produced in a, what, in a nation, that's GDP, right? So you've got GDP and then you've got time in a nation, right? Then over time, GDP increases like this. That's what happens with GDP over time. But it's not straightforward like that. What usually happens is that it will fluctuate up, down, up, down, up, down. And those ups and downs, the downs, we call them recessions, right? And then the ups, we call them uh, the booms, the expansion, the booms, uh, the expansion or boom, let me just say boom, expansion or, or boom, right? So when you're talking now in terms of economics, right? You are saying the when part, you are trying to make a decision in terms of what, uh, what do you call it, what policies or what decisions can you make at a specific period in time? What type of decisions are available to you at a specific period in time? For example, during a recession, what decisions can you make? During a boom, what decisions can you make? So for example, as a government, you've got two different types of policies. You've got a expansionary a fiscal policy and a contractionary uh, fiscal policy. So the question now is when do you implement the expansionary one and when do you implement the uh, contractionary one? Or as an individual business, for example, you can decide when to enter a market or when to exit a market. So economics can help you decide whether this is the correct time to enter a market or this is the correct time to exit a market. For example, we have what we call the shutdown rule. Shutdown rule basically tells you when you should exit the market. If you're making this specific profit, please enter the market. If you're making this specific loss, please exit the market. So that's the when question. Then the where question, we are basically now talking about international trade, right? We are saying that in international trade, you will notice that if you go to South Africa, they produce cars, they produce agricultural goods. If you go to the USA, they produce uh, your, your pharmaceutical goods, they produce your computers. Right. If you go to, uh, to, 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 to China, they have a lot of manufacturing that is happening there. Why is that? If you ever thought to yourself, why, why 
is certain production happening in certain regions in the world? That's again an economic concept. We're not talking about absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Again, it's a macroeconomic concept. Uh, it's absolute advantage and uh, comparative advantage. We were saying that what advantage do we have in South Africa? to produce the things that we are producing. Why did we decide that it is better for us to produce cars and to not produce pharmaceuticals? Is it not better for us to produce everything for ourselves and become self-sufficient? Actually, no, it is not. Therefore, we are going to make an economic decision in terms of what we are going to focus on or what we are going to specialize on as a country. And therefore, because of that, we're going to answer the question of where certain things should be produced together. In what in economics, so that's the uh the the, the way and uh and the way that he's talking about. But like I said, if you check most textbooks, you will not find the, the way and way. They will just be discussed when you go to my macroeconomics, not under micro uh, economics. But I understand maybe it's just with a different approach from here. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions? No, thanks. Thanks, James. For me, I think the introduction was okay. Uh, it's just that um, sometimes uh, when you when you look at the possibility, what, what the productive possibility curve, mm -hmm. production possibility curve, sometimes it, it becomes um, tricky. But uh, we, we did get the introduction today, but. I will appreciate if uh, maybe from our next lecture again, we can go and revise it again so that we'll have a, an understanding because what, what I've, I've realized is that if you miss it at the beginning, it becomes difficult to, to understand other, uh, 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 other um, what, what do you call them? It's a, uh, I'm not sure there is a diagram or what. Okay. Uh, uh, Forward, yeah. Okay. So, so, so it, it should be proper, like accounting. If you are, if you understand the the accounting mm -hmm. equation, um, okay. the theory of okay. the accounting equation, it becomes easier mm -hmm. to flow with the, all the principles of the accounting going forward. So okay. uh, I will appreciate if next time we, we can start uh, looking at the production possibility curve, uh, do the revision, and then we carry on with the with the other chapters. That I, I'll be sorted if we can do that. Okay. What I can do, maybe I will just try to look for a question uh, that, that we can do that uh, relates to the production possibility camp so that you can see the type of questions that you are likely to see when you're looking at the production possibility camp. Because the, the major concept when you're looking at the production possibility camp that you're going to be asked is how do you explain scarcity using the production possibility camp? How do you explain opportunity cost using the production possibility curve. How do you explain the concept of uh, decreasing, uh, sorry, increasing opportunity cost using the production possibility curve? How do you explain the concept of uh, utilization of resources under utilization of resources? Oh, okay, I think, I think that, that, that that should be fine, James. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So that, that, that's okay. All right. Uh, thank you guys uh, for, for coming in today. I'm sure we'll meet again uh, next week. Uh, for, for our lecture, I think it would be Tuesday. But like I said, for economics, we might have to sometimes do some juggling in terms of our dates. But I'm sure we'll just communicate uh, for, 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 the, for the next day. But for now, let's just provisionally put it on uh, Tuesday next week for the, for the next lecture. I will send the link to the, to the videos and I hope you all have a wonderful uh, evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay.